all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hmm. And even as Joel was just mentioning, one of the biggest challenges is seeing a Messiah that had to suffer. That doesn't seem to resonate with a lot of people. If there was one place that you would take someone from Israel, a Jewish person in the Old Testament to show them the nature of the Messiah and reveal to them the true message of that scripture, where would it be? Hi, and welcome to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, and today we're going to answer that question with Joel and with an expert from the area, Jeff Quazo. Thanks for joining us, guys. Joel, welcome. And Jeff, welcome. Well, it's Good great to, to be with you, Carl, and, and with you, Jeff. Uh, uh, just by way of a little introduction to our audience, uh, Jeff is a pastor uh, in England. He is... Uh, uh, he's been to Bible college in the States. He's born and raised in New Jersey. So that's why we, you know, my wife particularly, uh, we like him because he's a, he's Jersey strong. Um, he worked with the Joshua Fund actually a number of years ago um, and was a great uh, blessing on our team. Then the Lord called uh, he and his wife off to do some other things. But as it happens, uh, the Lord wasn't done with him uh, in terms of um, us getting to walk together and, and serve together. And so uh, just in the last year or so, uh, Jeff has come back on the team, um, encouraging pastors and, and ministry leaders. And, and, and he's just gotten a wealth of experience both here in Israel, but elsewhere around the world as well. So Jeff, I just want to welcome you aboard. And uh, this is your first podcast with us. You've actually been with us now for a number of months, but I'm just uh, glad to, to uh, for you two to be together in England, though I wish I was with you and uh, glad to have you on the podcast. Hey, thanks, Joel. You know, it's a pleasure for me to be here and it's a blessing, obviously, to just be a part of really what the Lord's doing and what we're getting to be a part of um, when it comes to the work of the Joshua Fund. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, Jeff, let's start with that question. You know, you've worked in Israel, you've, you've been part of this as a, as a staff member of the Joshua Fund, and as someone who really does interact with those that need to know this message of the Messiah, where would you take them? I think, you know, it becomes pretty clear uh, pretty quickly um, when you go to a verse like or a chapter even like Isaiah 53. When we think about the verses that, that we find in that chapter, I actually have had the experience personally of reading that chapter to a Jewish person. And at the end of it, they said to me, I didn't say anything. They said to me, knowing kind of having had a little bit of background, you know, around the world, they said, is that talking about Jesus? Because it sure sounds like it's talking about Jesus. <laughs> and I thought, okay, you said it, not me. So exactly. I'm very curious. Exactly. I mean, it, it must be something though that you have to deal with in Israel. You know, this passage is in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there. What's the relationship between Jewish people and this chapter in Isaiah? Because it is so much about the Messiah, at least from our perspective. Mm. I mean, again, I think when, when someone is going to go ahead and study the Old Testament, when it comes to both the law and the prophets, you can't miss that one of their prophets, a, a prophet for the nation of Israel, was speaking about a coming one that clearly, as, as I already have alluded to, sure seems to represent what we know of the story of Jesus when he would come to this earth. And so it's worth you know, bringing out the point when it talks about the fact that all we like sheep have mm. gone astray and talking about how there was iniquity laid on someone to pay mm. a price for someone else. Mm. We got to start kind of asking ourselves the question, who is this talking about? Similar to the eunuch there in the book of Acts when Philip was talking to him. And, and, and that's exactly right. I mean, I think sometimes we have to find someone who can unpack this for him. Joel, w what would you say when you when you come to a passage like this? If you were talking to a Jewish person, uh, how would you unpack Isaiah 53 for them? Carl, I would say that Isaiah 53 is the single most important messianic prophecy in, in all of the Jewish scriptures, all of the Hebrew scriptures. There, there's literally not a single prophecy more important. There are Others that are important, uh, a lot of them. Obviously, we, we think of uh, Micah chapter 5, where it talks about the Messiah has to be born in Bethlehem. Not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, not Bethlehem Steel, not, you know, Beth it has to be Bethlehem of Judea, Bethlehem Ephrata, the one that's just south of 
uh, Jerusalem, just five minutes from here, literally uh, very close to where I'm speaking to you, where we live here in Jerusalem. Now, that's important, right? Because there are many hundreds of thousands of um, Chabad Lubavitch Orthodox Jews in New York and here in Israel who think that the Messiah was a guy named Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, who was born in Brooklyn. And uh, my father was born in Brooklyn. And I got to tell you, the, the Messiah is not coming from Brooklyn. I love Katz Deli, but it's never going to happen because the Bible says it can't happen. It says exactly where he has to be. So I have often talked about messianic prophecy as like a phone number. And if you started dialing my American phone number, 703, just dialing those numbers, you've already eliminated the entire planet except for the state of Virginia. You've eliminated all of Virginia except for Northern Virginia just by dialing 703. Now, I'm not going to give you uh, – you guys know my number, but I mean the rest of the people, I won't give that out right now, right? But the point is as every digit that you dial up to the 10th, the computers are eliminating options. So when you get to the last number, it finds you. Right. That's almost miraculous when you think of how crazy that is with seven and a half billion people in the world. How are you going to find the one person? Well, you, that's that's what a phone number does. That's what messianic prophecy does. It eliminates options. And what Isaiah does is he says he, he's eliminating the option of somebody that didn't suffer and die for the sins of the people. Now, I'll just say one other thing. And then, I, you know, Jeff, maybe you could just read some of the passage to us so we can just start to you know, unpack it. But the, the reason this is the single most important prophecy of Messianic prophecy is because the prophecies do tell us, Isaiah chapter 9, for example, that the, the Messiah is going to be king. Obviously, a Mashiach means anointed one, which means king. And it says that the, the government will be upon his shoulders. And Isaiah chapter 9, of course, talks about uh, he will be the prince of peace. So Many Jews will say, well, okay, where's the king? Where's his rule where there's peace all over the world? I see wars and rumors of wars. Just look at Ukraine. Look at, you know, Syria, right? But those elements are part of who the Messiah must be. But the confusing part for every single Jew that I've ever met is, what are you talking about that he has to suffer and die? Jesus suffered and died. So that means he cannot be the Messiah because he didn't set up a global reign and, and bring us peace. That's why Isaiah 53 is so important because if you if you understand that all the prophets knew that that passage was important and all the Jews of the time knew that that was important, but they didn't understand how these things fit together. Yeah, well, and I think you hit it on there. They're not exposed to that as part of the message. And I think that's that's something we want to talk about. But Jeff, maybe you can talk to us. You know, what are what are some of the verses that really jump out from what Joel just talked about in terms of the prophecy? Yeah, and let's let's maybe pick up in Isaiah 53, 4, where it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Mm -hmm. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Mm -hmm. And even as Joel was just mentioning, one of the biggest challenges is seeing a Messiah that had to suffer. That doesn't seem to resonate right. with a lot of people. And yet, the fact remains there's an issue of sin and a sin that is separating us from God. We've just come through a time of the Yom Kippur, and we understand that this is a time for the nation of Israel where they are you know, working as you know, Day of Atonement, hoping that God is going to accept them. There is a recognition that there's a need mm -hmm. to be forgiven of sin. Mm -hmm. And so when we understand that somebody has to pay the price for those sins, we need a Messiah who can forgive us of sin. And, and the way that that has to happen is being that lamb of God who can take away those sins. That's right. And historically, the rabbis struggled with this concept because they could see in Isaiah 53 and elsewhere, this concept of a suffering servant Messiah, Isaiah 49, I believe also and elsewhere, but they couldn't reconcile it with the idea that the Messiah would come and be the conquering king and rule the planet and bring peace. So, so there were, a, a theory developed that there would actually be two messiahs, that there'd be Messiah ben Yosef, Joseph, that would suffer and seem to die, but then sort of come back. Remember the story of Joseph in Genesis, uh, the young brother of the brothers who hate him, because he has this dream that he is going to save everybody and they're all going to bow down to him. And they're like, 
heck no, right? You know, as many older brothers are, you know, are want to say to their little brothers, even, you know, Joseph's father thought this is crazy talk. And so what happened? The brothers were going to kill him, Joseph, but then they thought, well, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery, but he'll effectively be dead and gone from us. And so they think he's gone. He's dead effectively, but they didn't kill him themselves. That's their theory. Mm-hmm. But what happens? He shows up. He he reappears as the prime minister of Egypt and he saves the family. He saves the nation of Israel and he saves Egypt and the known world because God used him to do exactly what Joseph had dreamt of. So the rabbi said, well, maybe he's there's going to be a Messiah son of Joseph. It's interesting, by the way, we'll just note that Jesus was the son of Joseph. <laughs> Literally, his, his <laughs> earthly father was named Joseph. But even if you set that aside, some rabbis, not all, did think, OK, that's possible. But that'd be the first Messiah that comes. He'll be punished for our sins in some way. We don't quite understand that. But then the Messiah that most Jews like to talk about is the, is Messiah ben David, Messiah son of David. So David, of course, was the, you know, the king of Israel, right? And and we know that he will, the Messiah will be called the son of David, right? He'll be the descendant of David's prophetic messianic line, a kingdom line. So that was the challenge that rabbis and the Jews couldn't process these two concepts. So they thought there's two different messiahs. What they never considered was that it's not two different people, it's two different comings, right? And if you think of it differently, you think, well, the Messiah comes the first or the first time to suffer and die, and then he comes the next time to be the king of the world. That would make sense. Well, that's Jesus. Yeah. Uh, so that's why this yeah. stuff is so important. You, somehow you have to get both of those concepts into a, a system that works. The New Testament works, but you know, for 2,000 years, nobody else has come. Well, Joel, uh, Jeff, we're going to take a break right now. And We're going to actually uh, unpack that a little bit about why some of the obstacles that the Jewish people have had to even actually encounter in this message uh, when we get back. Our verse for the day today is found in Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Today's prayer requests are for, number one, Jewish people to encounter and understand through the message of Isaiah 53, the reality of their Messiah, and that they would understand and accept the work that the Messiah has done for them, Jesus has done for them to take on their sins. And second, to pray that those in the body of Christ in Israel would be faithful in bringing this powerful avenue of messianic prophecy uh, to those Jewish people that they know. So there would be great conversations taking place throughout the land. Well, Joel and Jeff, we're back and we're exploring this amazing chapter of Isaiah 53. And again, for those of us that have known and, and studied this chapter and read it as, as believers in Jesus and Yeshua, it seems so obvious. But there are some uh, real barriers in uh, today's Jewish uh, society to actually even reading this scripture. Maybe some of you could tell some stories about how that obstacle is in place and, and how some people are trying to get around it. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Uh, well, first, um, I've had similar experiences that Jeff mentioned in the first portion of the, the podcast where you know, I like when I can to say, hey, let's open up a Bible on our app or, or an actual Bible, and especially if they can open up it in Hebrew, but okay, if not, at least in English, so I can read it. But the point is, and say, why don't you read this this chapter and tell me what you think? And similar to Jeff's experiences, I've had people say, no, no, I've told you, I, I don't want to read the New Testament. I'm not interested in Jesus. I'm interested in reading the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, the Tanakh. Seriously, don't offend me. And I said, I haven't taken you to the New Testament. This passage is from your scriptures. This is the prophet Isaiah, which, by the way, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947 in the in the caves of Qumran, right, just a few miles from where I am, the longest and best preserved of those scrolls is the Isaiah scroll. And it literally is 
on display at the Israel Museum in a section called the Shrine of the Book. And it's this huge drum. Maybe we can put a photo of something in the, in the show notes or something, but anyway, or a link to it. But they've wrapped the Isaiah scroll, the entire thing around or part of it around this drum. So you can, but this is the biggest, best known preserved. <laughs> Why? Because the most messianic prophecies come from Isaiah. Why do you think God allowed this one to be the one that everyone remembers? So it is interesting. And I, just one more thing. And um, Jeff, you started in verse four, which makes sense. We're not trying to do verse by verse right now. But I will say even disbelief that Isaiah 53 points to Jesus is in fact part of the prophecy. Verse one, <laughs> who has believed our message, Isaiah says, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? They literally, the first sentence of the prophecy is Isaiah saying, who is even going to believe this? Because my people don't. Mm. And he's asking, to whom are you going to reveal this, Lord? Because a person can read this and not see it. Some of our listeners and viewers will be old enough to remember those computerized paintings or whatever they were, images in the mall. I don't know anyone who actually bought one, but maybe they did. They must have. But anyway, you'd look at it and you'd stare at it and you couldn't see anything but these kind of weird designs. And then if you, when your eyes shifted a little bit, you'd be like, oh, there's a battleship or there's a moon or, you know, whatever, a spaceship. And you'd be like, oh, wow, I, I see it now. The Holy Spirit needs to reveal this. It says it, but my team is mostly blinded to the truths. But what's the key? Paul tells us in Romans, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or the word of the Messiah, right? Hearing or reading. Now, at the time he said it, most people didn't have access to their own copy of the scriptures, uh, but now you do. And so the key is actually reading it. And when you read it, the Holy Spirit begins to open people's eyes. Jeff, have you seen that? Yeah, yeah I think that one of the things that continues to come forth from for me from Isaiah 53 is even just some of the terminology when it comes to, as we just talked about, this idea of sheep going astray, and yet there being one who is going to take their punishment. I mean, we can't help but think about how since the beginning from Genesis 22, when, when Abraham himself was there with his son Isaac ready to sacrifice him, he says, you know, Dad, I see the wood, I see the fire, Where, where's the lamb? And, and again, since that beginning of time, really back in those days, prophetically, the answer from Abraham God will provide himself mm. the lamb. He mm. is the lamb of God who is going to take away these sins of the world. And so here, us as sheep, being the ones who are guilty, who are going astray, doing our own thing, and yet God himself declaring, and I'm going to come and I'm going to take your place and really take your punishment. Your iniquity is going to be laid on me so I can forgive you. Mm. Being the good shepherd, and yet at the exact same time, being the lamb of God. Yeah. Amazing. That is amazing. Well, again, when you look at um, verse uh, 2, for example, Isaiah 53, verse 2, for he, whoever this Messiah is going to be, he grew up before him, before him, meaning before God, like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground, meaning it's basically that's Bible talk for out of nowhere, okay? Like things don't grow out of parched ground, but this person's going to emerge and he doesn't have any stately form or majesty that we should look upon him nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. In other words, the prophet is telling us that when this person comes, they're not going to be a matinee idol. They're not going to be, you know, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, I don't know who, that you're going to think, oh, that guy rocks because we're so drawn to his, his physical appearance. What it says is he was despised and forsaken mm -hmm. of men. Now, you're, you're like, again, if you think of yourself as a rabbi or just as a Jewish person who's discovering Isaiah 53 for the first time, you're like, just to be clear, you're saying that my Messiah is going to come and he's going to be ugly or at least despised. People are going to be like, why would I even want to pay attention to him? He he came out of nowhere. He There's nothing that's drawing me to him. That goes on. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, like one whom, from whom men hide their face. Yeah. He was despised and we didn't esteem him. We didn't think of him as important or worth our time. But then it picks right up with what Jeff read in verse four, but he, surely he, our griefs, he himself bore our sorrows. He carried right. And that God has struck him and destroyed him to killed him for us. Like again, that this is why when you 
ask a Jewish person to read it or you read it to them, again, I prefer and I encourage people to ask people to read it. You know, ask them to pull it up on their phone or you pull it up in your phone and pull out a Bible. Uh, but find if they have a preferred translation, like from the Jewish English Bible that doesn't have the New Testament, that's the best one. OK, but let them read it. So you're not force feeding it. But if they won't, okay, you can read it to them. It's fine. But the point is, these are the elements why it, it, most people don't know the story of Jesus, but they know enough from culture to know that Jesus was rejected, that Jesus was despised. And they themselves know as Jews, they themselves are not esteeming him, right? So the first verses, you have a skeptic coming in and go, I'm not going to believe this. Exactly. <laughs> like, oh. The prophecy is telling us that Jews aren't going to believe this at first and that you're not going to think of him as high and you're not going to think of him as God. You're going to think of him as like not worthy of your time. That's part of the prophecy. And I yeah. find that interesting. One other thing, you know, the book of Proverbs, of course, is such a, you know, it's the book of wisdom, right? And 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 many Jews will say that, the you know, this is part of the wisdom literature, right? The, the book of Proverbs is important. These are the Proverbs of King Solomon and others that help us understand how to live, what's true, Right. Well, how does the book of Proverbs conclude? After 30 chapters of wisdom from God to help you understand him and us and how to live and how not to be wicked, but how to be righteous, there's a test at the end of Proverbs. And God says, who has established the ends of the earth? And you'd be like, well, that'd be God. Okay, that's uh, Proverbs 30, verse 4. And then he says, what's his name? And what's his son's name? Surely you know. That's the pop quiz at the end of the book of Proverbs. Like I get 30 <laughs> chapters of wisdom and now you're asking me the name of the son of God. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, mm. it's fascinating. We're coming to a point where we need to kind of wrap things. But let's be clear. This is a helpful way to address this question for Jewish people, not just in Israel, but all over. You know, maybe in, in your work or, you know, someone listening to this and thinking my neighbor or my friends. But what models in Scripture would you see about kind of coming alongside someone and explaining what this passage actually means. Yeah, I think, again, I think it's it's understanding the heart of God, um, for starters, that, that God's heart has been to save his people. He desires to dwell among his people, and he has made a way possible. And he's been telling us that, you know, he's been giving us understanding since the beginning. This doesn't have to be a mystery. It doesn't have to be challenging. It doesn't have to be something where you're going to have to really figure it out. He's trying to reveal himself to you. And as you said, Joel, and I completely agree, it's the faith that comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If we open the scriptures and read them, and it's, mm. you know, I, I referenced it earlier, but I think about with Philip, um, you know, God directing him very clearly to a man, uh, you know, going down on the road in the desert. And of all places, he took that man to was Isaiah 53. And a, the question that came from that interaction was, who is this talking about? And, and that would be my prayer as well, is Lord, move on hearts, open blind eyes to see and to really have that question, who is this for one? And then how does this impact my life? Um, if this is actually the Messiah of Israel, what does this mean to me? And what does this mean to my family? Yeah. And, and Joel, I think you'll agree too. Sometimes we even, we even encounter people who don't know, Jewish people, who don't know that Jesus was Jewish. I, I remember talking to one a uh, person who said, yeah, I, I talked to someone and they said, well, they thought he was Italian because of the Catholic Church and all right, of that. Right. So this is a critical passage to really connect Jesus for Jewish people to his Jewish nature. Absolutely. Final, uh, just final thought here. If you go down to verse 9, Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 9, it talks about that, that this Messiah didn't just suffer. He, he actually is dead. Okay, that's an important point. He's not just, uh, you know, attacked uh, like uh, like a lamb to the slaughter. He's actually killed. He says, the Bible says in verse eight that he's cut off. And then in verse nine, it says his grave. Why would you need a grave unless you're dead? Because you're dead. So the, the Messiah's grave was assigned with wicked men, right? He's considered a wicked person by the Jews, right? And by others. And he was with a rich man in his death. The text then says, but he hadn't done any violence and there wasn't any deceit. There wasn't any lying in his mouth, but he's still killed. He still has to go to a grave. And then it says, but the Lord, I mean, the God, the father was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render him as a guilt offering, when you have an offering on the day of atonement and you had a temple back in the day, you had to kill something. Somebody's blood has to be spilled to cover 
your sins. That's what atonement is. It's blood of an innocent being or thing covering your sin. So your blood doesn't have to do it. And so Jesus or the Messiah is called a guilt offering, meaning he has to die. He has to, his blood has to be shed. But then, then it's important as we close, still verse 10, but he will see his offspring and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And you're like, wait, what? We, you just yes. killed him. What do you mean he's going to prosper? What do you mean he's going to have like people that are like going to be considered like his offspring, his sons, his daughters, whatever. How, how is that even going to happen if he's dead? Mm. Interesting. So I just think this is so important. And, I, and I'll just uh, – a uh, dear friend of mine, a uh, dear friend of ours, Mitch Glazer, a Jewish believer, arguably the foremost uh, theologian within the Jewish believing world, uh, runs a ministry called Chosen People Ministries, which we love. Anyway, he wrote a great book, which I would commend – to everybody watching or listening, if you're watching, you can see the cover, Isaiah 53 Explained. And then the subtitle is This Chapter Will Change Your Life by Dr. Mitch Glazer. We'll have a link in the show notes. But that's a great book, and I would commend it to your attention because it's not, you know, it's not huge. You can see it's not like some 800 page theological treatise, but it just walks through very simply in more detail than we can do on a single podcast. Why is this chapter important? What does it mean? And it includes the common objections from Jewish people. No, no, no. You're misinterpreting that that chapter. It means X, Y, or Z. And and um, and Mitch Glazer does a great job, just very simply and clearly walking it through, including taking Isaiah 53 and then looking at what are the New Testament passages in the Gospels that show us that Jesus, in fact, has fulfilled these specific prophecies. Mm. Yeah. Jeff, any final words as well? Joel, thank you so much for that. Any final thoughts on this passage? Well, again, I think we just want to continue to be praying for for folks to understand these truths. I think, you know, when I think about the heart of Yeshua, of the Messiah, he himself, he saw those like sheep without a shepherd who were scattered and his heart was burdened. And, And here he himself came to take you know, their place to pay that price so that they could be forgiven. And so, again, I believe his heart is for all mankind, that they would know the price that he paid, that he was willing to be that suffering servant, but he also is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So as we talked about earlier, he is both. And and it's amazing. Amen. Well, it's been a profound joy to talk to both of you guys about this. I know that your heart to see Jewish people uh, meet their Messiah and understand who he really is through this passage is so evident and and in uh, in so many ways it really represents the heart and soul of of what we're about at the Joshua Fund because we really do care for the souls and the hearts of Jewish people as they uh, live in in the land of Israel and as they uh, are across the globe as well needing to know and meet their Messiah Jesus Christ so if you'd like to learn more about the Joshua Fund uh, visit our website at joshuafund.com. And there you can learn about what we're doing in the Middle East to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus and how you can participate in the healing work that we're doing in this critical region. And as always, as Joel said, check out our show notes for anything you heard on the podcast that you'd like more information on. For Joel Rosenberg and Jeff Quazo, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.